The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take good Good morning, church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today we are continuing in Daniel, and we're going to look at Daniel chapter 11 today. So as we talked about on Sunday, and as we mentioned yesterday, but I'm going to say it again, Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12 is one continuous conversation. It's one thought. It's one prophetic vision with understanding. And yesterday we talked about Daniel chapter 10, which set the stage for the context of Daniel chapter 11 and Daniel chapter 12. So Daniel 11 and Daniel 12 comes in the context of what Daniel was doing in Daniel chapter 10, where he put his face to seek the Lord by prayer and fasting. And and he did that three-week fast. And as we were talking about it at the end of the, the lesson yesterday, is Daniel chapter 10 is like the unveiling of what is happening in the heavenlies. Because there's this war raging in heaven between the the demonic and the angelic host coming against each other. And it's the people of God that seek the Lord and pray. And you have these time periods where there's this open heaven reality where, 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 where prayers get answered immediately and you, you receive from the Lord. And then sometimes you pray and seek and it's, it's like it has to get through a, a, a wall that's opposing it. And that's, that's what we see when the veil is pulled back in Daniel chapter 10. That's why we wage war against principalities and powers and evil spirits in the heavenly realm. That's why we use the authority of Jesus to bind the devil Because it's not people that oppose us, but it is the demonic forces, the wickedness and high places that we must come against. That's why you need the whole armor of God and you need the truth of your authority as a believer. And we talked about that quite a bit yesterday. And we also talked yesterday about Daniel chapter 10 and the way in which the context of it takes place. And it's, it's this context of in the midst of this chapter 9, chapter 10. And remember, we say chapter 10, we mean 10, 11, and 12. It's in that dynamic period in which Daniel chapter 6 is taking place. So whether Daniel 6 is, I believe, like most scholars do, it's a little bit before these, in which Daniel's thrown in the lion's den, where Daniel has this period in between 9 and 10 where he's had encounters with Gabriel and he's receiving this dynamic revelation and he's seeking God and seeking interpretation and it's and and the enemy is doing everything that he can to oppose Daniel so that's very powerful like I said yesterday I'm not gonna argue the the little dates and the minute details I I don't want to do that what I want to have is understanding that the enemy wants to kill you before you receive from God but if you push forward you will receive The enemy wants to hinder you, but if you push forward, you will receive and you will get an answer to what you are seeking after. But today we're going to look at Daniel chapter 11 and we're going to look at the first 20 verses of Daniel 11. So Daniel 11 itself is made up really of four different sections that we're going to look apart. We're going to look at the first 20 verses of Daniel 11. Then we're going to look at 21 to 35, which is Antiochus Epiphanes foreshadowing of the Antichrist kingdom because there, though there was partial fulfillments in history, there is their ultimate fulfillment in the Antichrist kingdom in the generation in which the Lord returns. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that tomorrow, actually. And then we're going to look at 36 to 39, which is the Antichrist religious activities. 
And then we're going to look at Daniel 11, 40 to 45, which is the Antichrist political and military activities leading into Daniel chapter 12, which is the ultimate victory of the people of God. So we're going to look at this kind of back to back to back. And today, when we read through Daniel chapter 11, here is the under or the first part of Daniel chapter 11, which is the uh, historical account. No, now when we say historical, here's what we mean. In Daniel's generation, when Daniel is prophesying these things, everything that Daniel is saying is prophetic for Daniel. Meaning that what happens in the Persian Empire, what happens with the Grecian Empire, what happens with the North and the South, and all of these different things that take place next, what we're about to read today, for Daniel was prophetic. It hasn't taken place yet. But for us, it is historic, meaning that we can look back through history at the prophecies of Daniel and see half of the prophecy fulfilled. And we understand that for a very specific reason. God lumps in the things that are now historic for us, which was, like I said, to Daniel still prophetic, and the things in the latter times together so that when we see some of them come fulfilled. We've seen about half of chapter 11 fulfilled so far. Then we can have confidence in God and assurance in the Lord that the other half of the chapter will be fulfilled also. So we're going to talk about this today. We're going to pray and then we're going to jump right into this. We're going to go ahead and read all the verses and then we're going to take a minute. We're just going to talk about it and we're going to kind of reference the previous visions that Daniel has seen, how God lays out the visions in the same exact way. Now, they're not the same visions. Daniel sees they're different each time. The last four visions in the latter half of Daniel's life, they're all different, but they all have a consistent theme. And this is something we see consistently through the prophetic word of God, that when God prophesies, especially this detailed, and he's prophesying of the end times, there are things that you see fulfillment of through history and partial fulfillments and foreshadowing of, but the ultimate fulfillment is in the generation in which the Lord returns through the Antichrist kingdom. So let's pray, and then I want to jump right into it. So Father, I thank you. I pray bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom revelation and the knowledge of your son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion, transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us to the image of Christ, growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We'll go with me to Daniel chapter 11. We'll start in verse 1, and then we'll just uh, we'll read through the verses, and then we'll go back through it. Also I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. Now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer and fairer than they all. And by his strength through his riches he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. And a mighty king shall stand up, and shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken, and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up, even for others beside those. And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him, and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. And in the end of years they shall join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of the arm, nor neither shall he stand nor his arm. But she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begot her, and he that strengthened her in these times. But out of a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, he shall, which shall come with an army and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against them, and shall prevail, and shall also carry captives into Egypt their gods and their princes, and with their precious vessels of silver and of gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. 
So the king of the south shall come in to his kingdom and shall return into his own land. But his sons shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces. And one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. And the king of the south shall be moved with choler and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north. And he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. And when he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. For the king of the north shall return, and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after certain years, with a great army with much riches. And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, but none shall stand before him. He shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom, and upright ones with him, and thus shall he do. And he shall give him the daughter of women, corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. After this shall he turn his face unto the isles, and shall take many, but a prince of his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. Then shall he turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Then shall stand up in his estate a razor of taxes in the glory of the kingdom, but within few days he shall be destroyed neither in anger nor in battle. Now we're going to stop here for today because verse 21 into 35 has a fulfillment in history, like we said, of Antiochus' epiphany. And that's, and that's where we're going to see some foreshadowing of Antiochus, where we see the rule that he had. He's a, he was a Seleucid king. He came up out of one of the four generals' regions when Alexander the Great fell. So Alexander the Great fell, four kingdoms rose up. And the Seleucid kingdom, the Seleucid empire, was the greatest of the four. And we see just all of a sudden Antiochus Epiphany comes into power. Now, we're going to talk about that tomorrow. But just as a quick little snippet into tomorrow, this is where we see the fact that Antiochus cannot be the little horn because the one that came before him was just, he, just, he was destroyed just in an instant. And the next person just rises up and takes over the kingdom. And that's where we know that Antiochus does that, which foreshadows the Antichrist in some of his activities. But Antiochus could not fill all of the prophetic scripture or fulfill all of the prophetic scripture dealing with the Antichrist being a little horn. Now, let's talk about Daniel 11 for just a second. Daniel 11 has three main historical understandings for us. Now, we said it again, but I'm going to say it again. For Daniel, the entire vision is prophetic. And that's important because if Persia, Greece, the four kingdoms, north, south, Antiochus foreshadowing, if, and the Antichrist kingdom, if all of it is, is prophetic to Daniel, if Daniel, 2,500 years, was to stand in front of you and he says, this is what I saw, this is the vision, and half of it is fulfilled, there is still yet half that needs to be fulfilled. This is why it's important when you study end time prophecy to study all of the section together. What I mean by that is there is a lot of scholars and PhDs and doctors that will try to steal this word from you. And when we mean steal that from you, we mean they will relegate the prophetic scripture to only being historic. But the, the passages are very clear, and we're going to see it even later, that 
These passage are for a time of the end. We remember this back in Daniel chapter 10. We didn't get to it very much in detail because we ran out of time yesterday. But when the angel came, he said, I will show you which will befall thy people in the latter days. For the vision is yet for many days in advance. Which means what he is going to give Daniel interpretation on. He's going to give Daniel understanding of the vision in 11 and 12 is yet for many days in the future. It's for the latter times. And that's very important because you don't want to read this and then relegate it off and say, well, it's all historic. It's already been fulfilled. There is no future Antichrist. There is no future under... And then you just disregard the passage. This is why we're very strong when we teach end time prophecy. We don't want to, I'm not going to argue specific details and like the little minute we could, but the main thing I want you to do is get an understanding that in Daniel's life, Daniel saw five visions. One in his teen years when he was with Nebuchadnezzar, four in his latter years. And Daniel 10, 11, and 12 is in Daniel's 80s. And he's prophesying all of it in advance. Now, when we read it, it's historic. The first 20 verses of Daniel chapter 10 compass three different main periods of time. The first one is it talks about Persia. There's four kings in Persia. It's talking about the four kings that are going to rise out of Persia. Now, that fourth king, it says, is going to stir up against the realm of Grecia, which means he's going to start to wage war and start to trouble the land of Greece. Well, we know that because when the next thing it says is it talks about a mighty king will come out of the Grecian Empire. Great dominion. Well, we know that in the Grecian Empire, or before it really was what we know as the Grecian Empire, that they appointed one man in the time of war. And his name was Alexander the Great. They put him in power to lead the, to lead the empire. And they placed him in power because of what Persia was doing against Greece. So Alexander the Great came into power and came against the Persians. So the Grecians came against the Persians and overthrew the Persian Empire. And then we know that he grew in power, but then he just all of a sudden he died. And when he died... It says that he was broken, the kingdom will be broken and divided to the four winds of heaven. When we know that, there is four kingdoms. There was four generals that come up out of the Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great dies, four kings rise up, and they create four different empires. And the empire that we really focus on is the Seleucid Empire. And the reason for that is Antiochus comes up out of the Seleucid Empire. And Antiochus, as we will see tomorrow and later on as we go through Daniel 11, was a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. Because there are things that he fulfilled, but he did not fulfill them in fullness. He's just a type and a shadow. And we see that a lot. The Old Testament was types and shadows, but it was not until the express image of the New Testament, where Jesus came and declared it and then we see the ultimate fulfillment of prophecy and victory not only just in Daniel because Daniel had some amazing details I mean Daniel and Daniel 11 has some of the greatest details about the Antichrist his character his rule and his reign both political and religious activities Daniel 11 or 10 11 12 is the longest prophetic passage in the Old Testament and because of a prophetic passage meaning it's one whole vision wrote out in detail. It even has more than Revelation 13 specifically. But through the book of the Revelation, we see the fulfillment of all of the prophecy where John gives the most detail of all of the end time scripture, where it goes piece by piece by piece, one after another in chronological order. The plan of God unfolded, consummating to the millennial reign of Christ and then the ultimate victory of the people of God and the throne of the Father coming to the earth where Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet and all iniquity, all sin will be thrown into the lake of fire for all of eternity. Now that's, a, that's a powerful truth right there, but when we read Daniel and we read these first 20 verses, these are the three sections we see. First, we see the Persian Empire. 
And Daniel prophetically speaks about the kings of Persia. And we know that in historical account, I'm not going to go through all the dates and the people right this second. You can go and study it yourself. It happened just like Daniel prophesied it. And then Greece, when Greece rose up, the mighty king, it happened just like Daniel prophesied it. When Alexander the Great fell, the four kings came up out of it, just like Daniel prophesied it. And then it gives a major historical account for 15 verses from verses 5 all the way into verse 20 in which we see the king of the north and the king of the south. Now, this is what we know as the nation or the realm of where Syria is at in Egypt, waging war, this war that takes place back and forth. And that's important because Alexander the Great's four kingdoms, one of them was the Seleucid Empire, which is where we see the the region of Syria. And this is where we see Syria and Egypt for about 15 verses in Daniel 11 go back and forth warring against each other. That's why we know going into verse 21, the man that's talking about that comes up in 21 is Antiochus Epiphany. We can look back in history and understand what took place. You know, Daniel was just prophesying it in advance. Daniel didn't know this many dates here, this many dates here. He just knew these things were going to unfold just like God said it. And then Antiochus comes on the scene. And now we know he's next because, like I said, we look back historic. And this is why it's so important that in Daniel chapter 12, the angel told Daniel that you're going to seal this up. Now, Daniel knew from the beginning this vision for, was for many days. It was for the latter times. This is for the generation in which the Lord returns. And the angel says, you're going to seal it up because it's for those people. The people in the generation in which the Lord returns can look at Daniel you know, 8, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 and understand the scripture because we can look at half of the chapter and look backwards and we can see it fulfilled just like God said it. And because we see that fulfilled, we can see the rest of the scripture and we can compare scripture with scripture, Daniel, Revelation, Isaiah, Zechariah, Zephaniah, Hosea, Obadiah. And we take all of the prophetic scripture and the teaching of Jesus and the teaching of Paul and the teaching of Peter. And we put all of it together. And now we understand the end time narrative. We understand God's storyline in the generation in which the Lord returns. And when we have this understanding, we can be people that are resolved. We can be people that are prepared. We are people that can remain faithful until the end because we understand the dynamics and the dynamics will be great. Trouble like has never been since the beginning of the world. We're going to get to that. It's in chapter 12. But we've already seen it over and over. The actions of the Antichrist will be so far greater even than what happened in Persia, even than what happened in Babylon, even than what happened in the Grecian Empire, even far greater than what Antiochus Epiphany did in the Seleucid Empire, which foreshadowed the Antichrist. And that's really important. So when we study the first part of these visions, I like to just really put the emphasis on, you know, maybe you want to go and grab your history book and take notes and write dates and, and really outline all the little minute details in Daniel chapter 11, verses 1 to 20. Maybe that's something that God is speaking to you to do, and there's nothing wrong with that. We want to mainly focus on the characteristics of the Antichrist to prepare the church to be faithful in a generation in which trouble will exceed none other. Transgressors will come to their fullness. That is my heart. That's the part of the forerunner message to prepare the people. Now, there are people that are called to the historic accounts and think there's nothing wrong with studying that. But I want to study the historic accounts in a way in which it equips me to have faith in God, to trust the latter half of the vision. If I know the first half has came to pass, and it came to pass exactly like God said it, I can trust the latter half that it will happen just like God said it too, because it is all one vision. They're not two separate visions. It's not Daniel said, this is the historic account. This is the generation. No, it's all one. And because it's one vision and half of it is fulfilled, we know the other half will come to pass too. Now, there's some things I just want to reference about the other chapters. We've already talked about them, but just reference them again. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel sees the four beast kingdom. He sees the lion, he sees the bear, he sees the leopard, and then the last beast. 
And we talked about it in Daniel 7. Daniel, the, the historic account from our point of view, 2,500 years after Daniel, we see Babylon, Persia, Greece, exactly like Daniel prophesied it. Well, Daniel sees the vision of the evening and the morning. The ram, two horns, he go, one horn, horn broken off, four notable, four notable ones. And then one comes out of it. Well, the ram, two horns, he go, one horn, four notable horns has all came to pass. It's historic. That part of the vision is true. So we know that the little horn that's coming after will come to pass in the same way. Daniel chapter 9, 70 weeks. Well, there's going to be a first a seven-week plan, 49 years. And then there's going to be a 62-week plan, 434 years, totaling up to 483 years. God said, I have this plan already in place. And then in the latter times, there will be one week. The Antichrist will confirm a covenant for one week. There's still one week left. And when we understand and we read history and understand that 69 weeks played out exactly as Daniel prophesied it, we can have assurance in the last week. The same thing with Daniel chapter 2. The head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron. That's, that's a foreshadowing of the Roman Empire both in the east and the west. But then you have the feet of iron and clay. And that's the Ten Nation Coalition and the Antichrist Kingdom coming out of that. Daniel chapter 11. Daniel sees the four Persian kings. Then he sees the Grecian king. Four winds, four kingdoms come out of it. And then we see the, the war between the king of the north and the king of the south leading up to Antiochus who foreshadows and leads into the Antichrist Kingdom. So over and over and over in prophecy, in the life of Daniel specifically, Daniel's in his 80s. He's in his fourth vision in the latter half of his life. He's in his fifth vision from God. And he's seeing the same exact trend take place over and over. These are what's going to happen, and this is the latter times. The visions are about the end times. And the reason why they're about the end times, even though we're focusing on the historic account, is the historic account prepares us to trust the rest of the vision that is focused on the Antichrist in the latter times. We're out of time, so we're going to stop here for today. We'll pick this up tomorrow. So, Father, bless these people in Jesus' name. I give you all the glory for it. Amen and amen. Church, I love you. God bless you. Have a great day, and we will see you tomorrow. The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or oh, the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good.